Hello, everyone. Welcome to Out of This World. I'm Jamie Hanshaw, and I have a super special guest for you tonight. I finally caught an actual live celebrity. His name is Jamie Kennedy, and you will know him from the movie Scream. Scream face. We were laughing because he is uh, doing a soy face. Do you know what that is? What's that? A soy face is um, like a meme that is going around of people who eat too much soy and they buy toys like Funko Pops. And whenever they pose for a picture, they're always like, that? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, I have a lot of people that buy Funko Pops though that subscribe to my channel. So we like Funko Pops. Okay, well, Jay has a fake Funko Pop and he also made a song about marrying a Funko Pop. So you'll have oh. to talk to him more about Funko Pop. So I'm so excited for you to be on. You caught an actual celebrity. How many, have yeah. you ever had anyone famous on your trial? No. Damn. You're the very first. How many episodes do you have? 20. Well, look at this. I'm starting it. Don't you forget. Yeah. So this is, we're going to try and keep it going and get some uh, more names, but I wanted to ask you, okay, first let's do a movie review of Scream because this is what Jay and I do. Um, part of our shtick is we watch movies and I make notes and then we come on the podcast and I read the notes and he reacts. Scream was so fun to watch because it was the time when I was in high school. So it took me way back. Um, the fashions, the stars that were in it were so essence of the 90s. And your character, I remember being like the breakout crowd favorite. Um, I believe it was one of your first roles. Is that right? My second role ever. Uh huh. My first role was in Romeo and Juliet. Right. Um, and it was... Yeah, my second role, it was a big role. Mm -hmm. For in terms of a movie, I've done like TV stuff and some commercials. Mm -hmm. And it but, was, um, it was, yeah, it was wild. So I remember watching that and thinking, you know, um, this person is going to make it in Hollywood because you did such a good job. I think you kind of outshined even the more veteran actors of the time. And this movie is so meta, meta, meta. Like it is a. That's very nice of you to say. Even with the movie inside the movie, when they make in the sequel, they make the movie Stab. Yeah. So there you got the meta. And then you're explaining horror movies throughout the horror movie. So that makes it even more meta. And it's really fun to watch because you're um, giving away points of the plot and I also think that Cabin in the Woods is derivative of this franchise I have to see it I never saw it oh okay yeah you have to see it and even the character that Frank Fran Kaz plays is very much like your character in Scream um, so you have all of these movie tropes and trivias that the killer is using in Scream to taunt their victims, right? Mm -hmm. You have Halloween references in it because yeah. that's such a uh, big horror movie. And then- uh, You're in high school? Yes, I was in high school. Uh, that's crazy, you seem like you're so young. Well, thank you. I, I make my own skin cream. So if you want, to, <laughs> if you want to purchase that, you can get it at our website. Because I was probably ten, I'm probably ten years older than you, but I thought I was like twenty years older. How old are you? Fifty-two. Okay, you are. Yeah. Wow, skin cream works great. Yes, beef towel skin cream, all natural. Your character, Randy Meeks, you described him as the gangly fifth wheel. Yes. And you did such a good job portraying that. Um, the Skeet Erwick character was watching The Exorcist, he said. So even the killers in this movie are influenced by the horror genre. 
yes. and they're trying to emulate this. Um, a lot of other serial killers, Jay did a whole series like last summer about serial killers. And it comes out that they are big fans of horror, especially movies like The Exorcist. Which one? You mean the movie? What did you say last summer? Jay did a serial killer series. Okay. And it came up a lot that the um, a lot of the famous ones were fans of the big horror movies, Halloween, um, Friday the 13th, and especially the Exorcist franchise. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. It's weird. It's meta on meta on meta. It's like the movie's inspired by something real, which is, was inspired by a movie, then copycat killers in the movie, but in people in real life, it's all crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like metaception yeah it is right what's your sign my sign yeah i know that may sound weird to a lot of people but it's a cancer okay we get along what's yours i really believe in that stuff i'm a gemini oh okay so we're very close Birthday we're close party. we yes we're very close. we've had some grooves so far i'm, I'm... just learning <laughs> 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 He's laughing no. at me in the other room now. This movie had something that I write a lot about in my books, which is something that I noticed is the death. How many of books did you write? I have three. Jesus, go ahead. That's incredible. Uh, I have one. Okay. What's your book called? Wannabe Hollywood Experiment. People oh, should okay. go to my website and get it. It's all about my trials and tribulations in Hollywood. And I might do an audio version of it because people like it. But it's sold about three copies. Oh, oh okay. Well, that's, a, that's about as many as I sell, but um, no, just kidding. Mine are called Hollywood Mind Control and Weird Stuff Operation Culture Creation. So it's all about uh, how they use pop culture to uh, influence and control the population. Ooh. In, one, in one of my books, um, I talk about the death of the mother and how this is a big trauma and Scream just went right into... Um, my theories about that that's one of the most traumatizing things that can happen to you in your life is your, the death of the mother so I think that they try to insert that a lot into movies as an extra um, traumatic experience for the audience yes they do that in Disney a lot mm -hmm. uh -huh. so and it was, it was pointed out to me by a consumer of Disney product that you notice that everything's happy and riding bikes and sweet and bright colors, but there's always either a dead parent or a divorced parent. Exactly. And so I forgot, is Nev's character's mother dead? She's dead, right? Yes. See, I don't even pay attention to the plot line because I'm acting. Uh -huh. And it's only after 25 years that I'm like, there's like, I'm going into the, um, the lore of it. And you're right. Like the way the new movies are tying in the old movies, I just remembered that Nev's mother was dead, and I think she was killed by a killer, right? Mm hmm So, yeah, there's a, wow. That's a very good observation. See, now that stuff, we can take head on. Okay. Um, let me grab my book real fast, and I'll show you something. Go for it. What city are you in, Jay? We live outside of Nashville. Okay. So I talk a lot about trauma-based mind control in Hollywood. And like we were just discussing, the death of the mother is very traumatic. The first movie I ever saw in the theater was Land Before Time. And that affected me so much that I had to go out and buy a um, little foot plush stuffed animal because I had seen his mother die in the movie. And I felt like I had to take care of that character now so you were saying that the entertainment let's say in this particular moment a movie worked you yes so yeah. you got worked yes definitely almost I, like a hypnotic thing yeah it, it was a, a psyche fracture almost okay. um okay. so i i just put together a little um collage here of all the different movies that like the death of the mother occurs in and there's like so many more 
but wow. I, I just think that that's not a coincidence. Um, and oh, when, wow. when you read my book, I'll send you these two books. And when you read it, you'll have to let me know if you agree. But here I put, I even put. Uh, this is this different than MK Ultra or the same thing? No, this is what I'm talking about. Project MK Ultra. Yeah. But it doesn't say it does. It's trauma based, which is MK Ultra. Uh, yeah. Trauma based mind control. So do you know about NACS? Don't, don't close it. Neurological okay. associated conditioning. Tony Robbins talks about it. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, everything we do in this world is to avoid pleasure to gain pain that's it and so that's our baseline you mean you want to feel huh you mean avoid pain and get pleasure right yes avoid okay. pain or gain pleasure uh -huh. that's why we literally motivate right if we don't take a breath in it's gonna be very painful mm -hmm. so start from there so what you're saying is the trauma neurologically conditioned so he has a whole thing where if I'm listening to a song and I burn my hand really bad, that song is now connected to that memory because mm -hmm. it's in my neurological conditioning. So what you're saying is kind of, it's the same thing, but it's like, instead of a physical altercation, it is a moment that is traumatic on the psyche fracture. Boom. Yes. And it connects with you. Is that yes. What you're saying? And that mm -hmm. makes you more connected to the movie. So like a Bambi. Um, Big time like... Bambi. Bambi's a dark movie. Yeah. So, and then would you say, I, I should have you on my pod. I got to have your husband too. But this is, my people would love this. So you're saying that almost it's like a nicotine, a psychological nicotine to keep you coming back and to keep you under their control. It is a opportunity to insert messages because that's when you are, your brain is very vulnerable is when you've experienced trauma and you're so suggestible at that moment. So um, like uh, Simba or Big Bambi time. or Littlefoot or Old Yeller or um, what else I got? Dumbo, Finding Nemo, uh, Lilo and Stitch. Just all of these. Uh, what's that one? The never ending story. That was all about yeah. the, the death of the mother. And then at the very end, he names the princess, his mother's name, which was Moonchild, which is a very esoteric thing that um, would take a lot to get into. So we're not going to do it right now. Okay. Um, but yeah, Moonchild. Uh, so then you have the Courtney Cox character and she yes. re represents kind of like the parasitic media and how they're very ghoulish, um, jumping right onto stories for views and clicks. You and should life. have started this whole conversation says, I'm going to show you how Scream connects within this paradox. That's awesome. I see what you're doing now. Oh, okay. She does represent. She does rep Gail Weathers, literally Gail Weathers. What a perfect name, right? Yeah, it sounds like a weather person or somebody on your nightly news. Or like the storm comes in. Oh, yeah. Goes through everything. But you're right, parasitic media, meaning she's there to get the story no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, the, the scream costume is called Father Death or Ghostface. Did you know that it was also called Father Death? Kind of. I just heard that. What does that mean? Um, well, I would say that that would be like Saturn. So Saturn is like Kronos or Father Time or the Grim Reaper. Um, and Saturn is worshipped in the occult circles as, you know, a god of death, basically, in black magic. Saturn and I know Saturn has a lot and there's Satan and all that stuff and in the eye of Sauron that's involved in that right yeah I would say yes this the Saturn death cult if you're interested in that look that up specifically okay um and Got a lot of homework <laughs> Dave McGowan actually so oh that's the interesting thing about Scream is that 
you're thrown off because there's actually two murders because um, you don't know how the one killer is getting to this place and killing this person while also being here and there at this time. And then the big reveal at the end was it was actually two guys. And this is something that author Dave McGowan talks about a lot um, when we think of the lone nut serial killer, you know, like your Dahmer or your Night Stalker or John Wayne Gacy. Um, what's that one in New York City? Son of Sam. So his work talks a lot about how these cases um, could be or most likely not just one person, but a ring or an organized cult of some kind. Have you heard that theory before? Regarding screen? No, just like, uh, you know, serial killers don't work alone. Yeah, I mean, I never heard of John Wayne Gacy was more than John Wayne Gacy or Dahmer was Dahmer, so that's pretty fascinating. But I have the whole theory of Scream while it will last forever because Scream is not A, supernatural, or B, um, you know, Michael Myers is almost supernatural. Freddy is like psycho psychomatic, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Texas Chainsaw, Leatherface. He's like inhuman, right? So like they, they kind of just keep living, Michael Myers and such, or Jason. But Ghostface is you. Meaning whoever has the trauma will wants to pay get back at somebody and they then take on Ghostface. So mm -hmm. the character is always going to be Ghostface, but underneath it is powered by someone else with new anger. That's a really and that's good why it will and it'll always keep going. Because it could be anybody. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a very good point. So um, in that way, your theory is correct that it's a group. Uh, let's see. She's surrounded by the killers at all times. And mm -hmm. this, this movie has a lot of good deflections. And it has a lot of Easter eggs, too. Like... Um, the janitor at the high school is wearing that striped shirt like Freddy Krueger, right? Who was like a, a janitor. That's in West Craven. Craven. Was yeah. Um, <clears throat> the mom had multiple affairs and this is what leads to, you know, capitulate the whole murder spree is her uh, sleeping around and your character is the one who comes out and tells all of the rules of the horror movie, right? And we were watching this and we've been watching horror movies for a while and we kind of did this thing on our own, like the rules of the horror movie. And we figured out that it was the virtues that save you in the end. So if you stick to the, you know, typical moralities, uh, it, not drinking, not having... SEX, no drugs, um, you're more likely to survive than if you are partaking in the passions, we'll say. And you do this scene at Blockbuster and it just lays it all out and it's like the perfect uh, encapsulated horror movie trope breakdown. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Mm-hmm. It's crazy to think about it, but yeah, it's not just because they're virtuistic, which they are, and it's like, hey, be a good person. Don't become a victim of a killer. But it's also like deeper now, the way you're making me look at it. Like, hey, it's good versus evil almost. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're making the killer say like, I had to kill these people because they were bad. But they try to kill Sydney which messes your theory up because she is virtuous. But she does uh, lose her V card in the movie. She did. The, the okay. killer. I, know. I forgot the, about that. She did. She lost it. Correct. That was yeah. the twist in this movie that um, you think, oh, now she's like going to die because she, she did that. Let's see. There's a line by Skeet Ulrich, and he says, it's all one great Ulrich. thing. Ulrich? Ulrich? Okay. Yeah, you said Ulrich. Oh, sorry. 
And he says, it's all one great big movie. And we talk about this a lot, how uh, the world is a stage and that a lot of the news is manufactured and a lot of things that we take for granted as being reality are actually fantasy. Do you agree with that? Yes. In fact, more and more, I was just watching a clip from Rogan's podcast with Adam Curry. You know Adam Curry? Or you know Adam Curry? He was a huge DJ, VJ back in the day on MTV, one of the originals, and now he's a huge tech guy. And he says that TikTok is getting banned by America, not for all the reasons it says. It's He's saying it's getting banned because it beats everybody else in advertising dollars. And not just that, it beats them to the punch um, and scoops even the mainstream news a lot of times because you can find things first on TikTok before it's even broken on television. But I do want to circle back and talk about talk about TikTok specifically in a second when we're done with Scream. Yeah, but yes, I do believe that what you said. Um, so number one, you you were doing this breakdown um, in the scene where you're standing by the, the TV, everyone's watching the horror movies and you're doing such a good job. You're like, you can never have SEX. Uh, you can never drink or do drugs. You can never say, I'll be right back. You know, the classic things that get you killed in a, a horror movie. And yeah. you're talking about movies creating psychos. Yes. Skeet says, movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos more creative. Great line. But that's Skeet's line. Mm-hmm. Um. yeah ca like he just mentioned to me again Cabin in the Woods you have to watch that because it takes the, the 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 third wall is kind of yeah. removed in fourth wall. fourth wall I mean um, it's kind of removed in Cabin in the Woods and it goes to, in a very weird direction so you'll have to watch that and tell me what you don't think. tell me okay i heard it's a really good movie yeah it's good but you'll see how um the character in that is, inspired it is so much like randy yeah so that's all i have for scream um it is a lionsgate movie which i talk about a lot that no production... it was miramax oh was it one of them is Miramax not Lionsgate? No. It was Dimension, which is a subsidiary of Miramax. And now it's Paramount. Oh. Okay. Did you see the movie Babylon? No, but I I did a, a pod about um I've got to see it because it looks like the type of movie that is epic. And the fact that it didn't connect with audiences makes no sense to me. Mm. But, it's, but I'm hearing more and more about, because I love that director and it had all these huge stars and it's about the creation of Hollywood. And I talk about that a lot on my channel. And so, and it's called Babylon. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing more and more now that there is a, uh, there's a cult in it. And, um, but Anyone, the whole pot I did about it will tell you that different people will tell you the best parts of Hollywood, the, the different decades, but I always heard that the 20s was the craziest by far. Oh, yeah. It was like the Wild West of movie making, right? Uh, so I talk a lot about Babylon, and that's actually how I met Jay for the first time. I was Googling Hollywood Babylon, and he had a article about the similarities between Babylon and Hollywood. I used to be a tour guide in downtown LA. So I knew all about that um, Babylonian courtyard on Hollywood and Highland. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. This thing. Yes. That's, that's just a picture from it. Right. Is that, is that Hollywood and Highland, the, the new one? Yeah. Okay. The one with the elephants on the poles and everything. So Were that you red bus tours. I'm sorry. Red bus? No. Just uh, independent tour groups. Okay. Yeah. But Go like, ahead. yeah, on a big coach, 44 people going up and down, pointing out Marilyn Monroe's house and whatever and this and that. I did that for a long time. 
Um, but one of my books talks about that that Hollywood Highland downtown area came from the movie Intolerance by D.W. Griffith. And that was an epic saga about like the fall of Babylon. Um, I think there was a passion story in there and there was like one other, it's a three part thing all about these gigantic um, points in history. I can't remember the third one, but it was Babylon and a passion story. Do you remember? He's not listening. But here you have these um, Babylonian gods hanging out right there in downtown Hollywood. And you also have this architecture of the ziggurat. You've seen that, I'm sure, like on off the five freeway, I think. The Citadel Outlet Mall. So yeah. Hollywood has always been associated with Babylon. It's which what is, is Babylon? It is a type of wicked worldly place like Egypt. Um, in the Bible, if you have like a Christian worldview, it would be, you know, Babylon and Egypt are very dark uh, places for pagan. Worship. Like Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you know what? It's crazy. What? It's such a bizarre pod so far, but I'm enjoying it. This is, it's so crazy. You're so right because I've gone to premieres at the Egyptian. I've, you know, I've gone my own premieres at Man's Chinese, which is, these are, but, but movies that I've started in hugely, and not just been in, like started, which I'm lucky, you know, and they're hugely iconic places and the Pantages. But now thinking of this, the, the, the citadel off of it. there's so much architecture like this that at first you think oh it's wow this is fucking me up blowing my mind excuse <laughs> my french That's because i look at it as when hollywood was born it was big and ostentatious and set decorators would where I live is basically from Fairfax to La Brea on Franklin was all Charlie Chaplin's house. Uh -huh. And the two big houses on the corner were guard houses. But they made these movies about these times, like, you know, Cleopatra and stuff. So you thought, oh, these are just leftover props, right? Or, mm -hmm. or the um, Frank Lloyd Wright designs. Oh, those are Frank Lloyd Wright. But now talking to you, and I knew this, but I, it's more deliberate than ever now, the way you're presenting it. And oh. there's a lot of gargoyles downtown. Yeah. In the building. On right. The building. Well, in my wow. first book, I talk about how the creation of Hollywood started with the cameras and the stop motion and the the flicker uh, cameras that were- What year? It was like- Early 1900s or late 1800s? Late 1800s. Edison and those people, you know, they were just getting into film and motion film, stop motion film, stuff like that. And first they had Nickelodeons where you would like go into a little booth and drop in your coin and you get to see like a little lady dancing or a cartoon or something. Mm -hmm. And these um, fell into being used for uh, PORN. Mm -hmm. And they did not want this in the upper society of the East Coast for one, and they didn't have enough sunlight on the East Coast for two. And so that's how they ended up bringing the entire industry from New Jersey to California because you could film um, a lot longer because the sun was brighter there. And this is where Babylon starts out the movie, the 2023 movie, is... Don't tell me too much, but okay, okay. go ahead. I, I won't tell you. There's nothing really to spoil, I don't think, but the movie is making a connection between Hollywood and hell. And the director, Damien Chazelle, is that how you say it? 
He said that this movie was a poison pen to the industry, but a love letter to the art form, which I, I agree with. I, I love movies, obviously. I've done all these books on Hollywood and I, I enjoy the art form. I enjoy the music. I enjoy the acting and the stories, um, but I do not enjoy the debaucherous side of it. And this does come out in the movie Babylon. Um, the themes are a lot like, there's a lot of fire, there's a lot of uh, demons. There uh, is at one point, um, it gets too hot for somebody in the filming box that they actually perish because it's too hot. And throughout this movie, people are dropping dead making movies and they just sort of push them aside and keep on filming to get the shot. You know, there's a dead guy here, but get him out of the way so we can get this movie shot. And I thought that was really apropos to kind of the industry, how they chew people up and spit them out a lot of times. Do you think that's true? hundred percent. You know what I always say is that the, the, the person, the, the thing that, the, the thing that constantly wins in Hollywood is Hollywood. Mm. So it's like if the house you look, when you're gambling. The house the when house you're when gambling. You're gambling. Yeah. The yeah. House. But if you look, if you go on my balcony and you look to your left, you'll see a perfect view of the Hollywood sign. Mm -hmm. And it lords over all of us. Mm -hmm. And it lords over not just LA, it lords over California, it lords over the world. Oh, definitely. It is the creation of what media is. It is whatever they want to create comes from that. And the it is. There's a reason why it's on the hill, right? The symbol similarities. And mm -hmm. the fact that I think about that, no matter what scandals happen, what deaths happen, bombs, careers. Ooh, now you got me going crazy because something lives, nothing lives without something dying. So you could argue that with the scandal, it's that karmetic energy of death and stuff that feeds it, that keeps Hollywood getting bigger. It's a blood sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. You could argue that, but in many ways that it could literally be that, or it also could be philosophically that or psychologically mm -hmm. that or energetically like that mm -hmm. because people will come and go their, their careers may die but they're going to get a next person and then that will go but then you go well the studio doesn't die but then studios do change and they get gobbled up and then they change but this steam keeps steaming along mm -hmm. wow it's kind of like that machine in um metropolis have you ever seen that movie the Fritz Lang. No, I have to. These are all amazing movies. These are early D.W. Griffiths and stuff. Yeah. Um, so. Which is why I thought that those architectures was like that because they were all based off those early movies. So I thought they kept them all. But mm -hmm. again, this is your specialty, not mine. Wow. Uh, that movie Metropolis, there is a scene in it when it's about like two class system so that the workers live underground and they keep feeding the city and keeping it going and then the leisure class lives above and they enjoy everything off the backs of the workers and in one scene one worker um envisions this giant furnace to look like the mouth of moloch and it's just eating people and they are the fuel that runs the city so the damage to human lives is so apparent um in this movie Babylon, because it's very much a cautionary tale about making it to the top with Brad Pitt's character playing a sort of Brad Pitt of that era, you know, the, the A-list it guy. Don't, don't tell me too much. Okay. So, um, is, the, I bet, is the movie amazing? It's almost amazing. I, cause you have, me, cause you, you seem like you have a better insight than a lot of people. I don't, I, I'm hearing that people didn't get it, but I don't think they understand what they were watching, how well, deep it is. We watch movies for a living, so we're we're pretty good at that. I didn't know that. I thought yeah. you guys were just like conspiracy theorists. Well, we are, but um, our main uh, 
I've never seen Jay do a movie review. I've only seen him do like, do like the talking about like MK Ultra. I've never seen him. So I didn't know that. Oh, that. yeah, we review all of them, all the movies, good and bad, oh. or everything. And we do really good. Oh, okay. Um, not the bad. So this is almost a masterpiece for me. It was a little long for a theatrical movie. <sighs> It was interesting in the way that in the beginning, it was more lighthearted as their lives weren't as complicated yet. And then the tone of the movie switched a lot following the circumstances of what was happening. So it went from just I like- I have to watch it. Yeah. And it, almost a dark comedy to just a dark movie. Um, and then there is, well, I don't want to give away. Don't give it away. Okay, so just pay attention. I know I'm gonna love it. To the scenes with Tommy McGuire when they go into the underworld, this is a, a very much a catabasis for the main character. And there's layers. Oh, after you watch the movie, you can watch me and Jay's review of Babylon. We just did it. We did Babylon, L.A. Confidential, and um, Black Dahlia. So they're just like Hollywood has different layers um, of glamour. So does this movie and is actually showing you like going down into the underworld to the base layer and like how disgusting it is under there. Metaphorically or actual? No, actually. You'll know when you see it. It's crazy. So... Okay, we don't have to talk about Babel anymore because you haven't seen it. So you'll just have to watch that. Um, but you did a podcast recently where you said that Hollywood is dying. Yeah. What do you make of that? It's a whole series I have of podcasts. And my first one was very similar to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. About um, how Hollywood is started by five Jewish fur traders you have mm -hmm. to read the book. I'm sure you read it called Empire of Their Own. And they came from um, disenfranchised families in Europe in the 1800s. And they came and the lore is that they created a reality which which they wanted. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did mm -hmm. Leave it to Beaver, was it really like that? Or did they create that and then people started copying that? My belief is, is that all the mandates are put forth by a few and say, this is what society is. And then people copy it. Like seeing people drink White Claw now in commercials, these drunk, like 25 year old girls, that's who's on social media getting drunk. And you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I believe it's put there and then people do it. So that was the original. And, and you obviously, mine was a, from a pure perspective of how it started on one level and then the psychological ramifications and the occult is more what you guys do. And, and I've been getting more hip to that lately and saying like low key how it's everywhere. Right. So, uh -huh. you know, I don't, I have to be careful because I'm still in Hollywood and I'm meaning like, cause not just that people think you're crazy. So you have to like, just give them a teeniest bit of the red pill slowly you know mm -hmm. but i think people are coming around mm -hmm. and i mean be careful in the sense of because people just they can't accept shit right but it's like i was talking to my friend the other day about the vegas shooting and how and he's a pretty staunch one-way type of person and he was even like no i could see your point like there was definitely stuff and i was talking about just a lot of weird shit with that right mm -hmm. so and so I was breaking Hollywood down in a practical sense, but you guys are breaking it down in a, like, like you said, like a psychoanalysis sense, which I love as well. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of it dying, it's dying on a few levels, I believe. Well, let's talk about it. Well, okay. The first thing is, is that the Golden Globes just aired on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. A Tuesday. I can tell you firsthand, the Golden Globes used to be one of the best parties in the, in, in the city. It was right there. It's like Oscars, Grammys, Golden Globes, like those three. 
and you go to the Golden Globes, you go to the watch party, you go to the official party, then you'd have the ex after party at the Chateau, then the after party. The I think there was a couple after parties at the Chateau. It was on a Tuesday. It was half attended. It was the lowest rated Golden Globes of all time. Now, I know there was scandal with it and different things that happened. But, and I know COVID happened, but that is insane. 34 years I've been in this business. Mm -hmm. And that is unheard of. Like, okay, so that's number one. Number two is, I think that people don't want to watch award shows because they don't want to be preached to. I think also a lot of people don't know the entertainment that they're being, that they're talking about because people are too busy making their own TikToks or doing their own Instagrams or doing their own YouTube. And the Oscars came out yesterday and it trended for a little bit. And I'm sure it's going to be good, but you know, there's four movies I really know. Mm -hmm. And the rest of them, I really don't know. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And so the idea of if there's five distribution channels, I was telling this to your husband, the 405 was the 405. And that's how you get to the Valley. Well, that's what Hollywood is like the 405 with no exit. Mm -hmm. But now there's tons of little exits and that's Snapchat, that's Instagram, that's Twitch, that's gaming. That's... So all of this stuff is happening, taking people's attention away. So from a basic level, it's dying because people are narcissistic. They believe they're great too. Instead of being fed a movie star, they're going, I'm my own star. I may not be known as acting, but I'm going to fashion blog or I'm going to cook or, or I'm just going to be me. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one way it's dying. The other way it's dying is the preachiness of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. The other way it's dying is the hypocrisy of Hollywood. Um, because, you know, they say this shit and then you always find that people saying the shit or doing the shit. And then, and then two other things. It will always be around with legacy media because they have stuff like, you know, the DC universe, Marvel universe, and people love these characters and the media they grew up with. They will always enjoy that. So they are going to consume that. But there's a lot of new media being made. It's just not being distributed by mainstream. But mainstream's market share is getting smaller because of people that are getting bigger, i.e. Mr. Beast. You know, he's only starting to get mainstream press in the last year and a half. But the guy's been huge forever. So the last thing I'll say about it is, is that now I believe more and more the underworld uh, whispers. Mm -hmm. the fact that i'm sitting here talking to you about it that's crazy like i'm an actor i'm a comedian you know but what's our job as a comedian why am i a comedian more now than an actor because an actor we used to be able to act well now it's like there's mandates to be able to act and what do you fit into a certain box and you used to be like the best person for the job and you know that's great we got to get better as a society but it's not like just you can come in audition now it's more like do you fit in a certain like box right mm -hmm. so that's why i am doing so much more comedy because i can be who i am right and just you know if people like me they come and buy a ticket mm -hmm. so and by doing that and with all podcasts and different things people are talking and talking and talking and everyone's talking and all these little geysers of truth are coming up and they're going to call it misinformation but it's not mm -hmm. there's a lot of truth geysers there's also misinformation but there's also a lot of truth so the fact that they don't say there's also a lot of truth is suspect. But number two is what you and your husband talk about and how that's happening more and more. The quote unquote conspiracy theorists, which is just a way to dismiss and completely make people irrelevant, which is not true at all. Um, these these whisperings of nefarious activity and darkness and quite frankly, evil, it depends on how deep you peel the onion, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's getting out more and more and people are like, to the point where I think in a few years, people are gonna be like, you work in, like, not, it used to be I work in Hollywood and people, no, you work in Hollywood? Like it's becoming that. And, and you know, like I said, I talked to Jack Osborne and we were just talking about it on my pod. It's like, 
you hear whispers of things, but you know, I never saw anything. Right. You know, but it's more and more people are coming about who are victims of crazy shit. And I think that that is another reason. I think people are so hungry for authenticity now. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why TikTok is so popular because you can just go on that and cry or do whatever. As long as you're being yourself, you will be received in a, a polite way. But if they sniff out any type of insincerity in you then no one's gonna follow you and that's what i think is so funny about tiktok like celebrities don't do very good on that platform because they're not you know know why you're right because they're trying um their hollywood uh what got them forward in that world is not gonna cut it in tiktok you know uh slick operations and high produced TikToks on a budget and lighting and cameraman and that's just not what that platform is for and the people are they don't want it um I go on that a lot that's my favorite actually uh I don't do Instagram or face none of that but I do like TikTok because the people are real and I can see them and I can uh feel what they're feeling because it's a real thing and it's funny because like Madonna will go on there and it is so cringe like have you seen Madonna's TikToks it's weird it's, it's not the it's just she's not the Madonna I grew up with it's definitely some weird stuff it's almost like a, a do not do this if you want followers so it anytime a celebrity comes up I just scroll right past because I'm not interested in them on that platform anymore like what did I just see Jared Leto it was so self-indulgent um this TikTok that he made and it was just like you're doing it all wrong and people reject them on that platform because they're kind of like this is our space you know we finally have an easy way to get ourselves out there um and the someone who is used to doing it the Hollywood way is a big turnoff but I do follow a couple. Um, Keanu Reeves knows how to TikTok. Um, who's that guy from Twilight? Robert Pat. Yes, he knows how to TikTok. So I follow him on there. It Basically, if you show me you're a real person and not resting on your laurels from Hollywood on TikTok, then, you know, you'll get a follow on there. But have... So you said you never saw anything weird. I, I wanted to ask you, have you ever been in a position where you had to turn down an opportunity because you were asked to be or asked to do something that was like outside of your moral boundaries or anything like that like compromised yeah never no okay i've never had that and what's crazy is is that i've gotten jobs i always thought through just auditioning and being prepared Mm -hmm. and you know i talk about that I've never had to S1D, if you will. But yeah, you could figure that. You're, <laughs> I'm trying to keep it polite. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, yeah, I never did. I, I just literally worked hard, you know, got some, and people eventually, they liked me, you yeah. know? Um, but it doesn't, you know, I mean, I guess it doesn't mean that people wanted to buy it. So I never saw any of that. I, I really am the epitome of a working man's, like, dream of, like, just grinding and hustling and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. doing anything I can to break in. I mean, I was crazy about doing this stuff. Mm. But, you know, so you hear these these stories, you know, like, you know. Right. So you were on um a show with jack what's his name osborne yes and you were talking about the fashion industry is kind of darker even than the music business and i i found this uh fashion (laughs) icon the old v-neck with a collar (laughs) yeah that's from screen yeah um what do you make of like what we see now in, in the fashion, it's getting really weird. It's getting very macabre. It's getting like 
past avant-garde to kind of like gross uh what do you think about that the balenciaga well first of all that picture is from scream so i wasn't a fashion person so just so your listeners know so they don't start coming after me um set that record straight okay but but you're saying i look fashionable i was just joking because it was like i know but who knows what your people right so yeah um well listen here's what i would say the dark the darkest um the most nefarious parts of the business i would say go like this i would i would say in this order it's like i would say tv is probably the cleanest because it's network it's corporate you know you got to sell dumb right i'm not saying they don't put mind control messages and all that stuff but it's in, in a nutshell it's tv right mm -hmm. um the movies can get darker because money can come from anywhere. A big studio will take dirty money, not knowing it's dirty per se, but they'll take a half a billion dollar fund to help fund their slate. And some of your biggest hits ever have been funded by very dirty money. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like to advertise that, but you can look that up. Um, also an independent movie can be funded by weird money. And what I mean by is like, the simplest thing is a hundred million dollars from a marijuana deal or a drug deal or whatever, right? This money funnels into Hollywood. That's why you see a bunch of douchebags driving Bentleys, but you don't know who they are. These are the rich guys that come in and they want to, you know, be part of the scene, but they have no access. So what do they do? They buy their way in. Mm -hmm. Music to me has always been the dirtiest because they just make the movie business look clean. And that's just because you, you can fund it, a mixtape or a tape anyway back in the day. And if it gets in the right hands, you get a deal. The deals are cutthroat, um, you know, stars can come. There's less barrier to entry there, um, but it's just, you know, with, there's too much to talk about in music, but just for one, if you look at it, the symbolism more and more is wild. And how they actually changed the frequency of music in the 40s, beats per minute. So that that's a whole thing a lot of people don't understand about. Um, so I would always say music, film, a TV, film, and music. But but to me, art, uh, fashion, and art. Uh, art is more of a laundering business. Again, these are not things I know, but this is just basic common knowledge if you have any knowledge of this business of, in terms of the creative aspect. Writing is pretty clean because it's usually nerdy guys and they, get this, they clean life. They're married, a couple kids, and they're trying to sell a spec script and stuff like that. I'm trying to go through all aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. um, art is a, is a very simple way to uh, launder money mm -hmm. because you can bid on a piece for $10 million. You can make $10 million doing something. Let's just say you made $10 million. I'll just make a crazy example, something nefarious. Let's just say $10 million selling uh, organs, right? I'm, I'm trying to give you an extra one because you're your audience. And then you get paid in cash. Mm -hmm. So I, there's a piece of Sotheby's. That's why these things go. And they buy it for $10 million. You never have to tell your name. You never have to tell who it is. It's completely anonymous. That's why you, they, Sotheby's doesn't even know. They get a wiring and a routing number. Money comes in. Piece is released. You then have this piece. And it's a $10 million note. Mm -hmm. that you can then sell again for clean money, money washed. That's a very common practice in the art world. Um, fashion, I mean, I'm not even in it, but it's just pretty clear what's going on there. First of all, it's the most wasteful industry. So Jack was saying how it's completely hypocritical because every three months, everything's outdated. So that's complete bullshit. Anyone talking about the environment in fashion is a liar. Mm -hmm. um clearly um you always hear those articles about the young models from europe they started when they're 15 and then these euro trash creeps and the girls getting in the clubs at 15 and 16 and smoking cigarettes you can talk to the older models today see what they experience it's usually eight or nine girls in a house and they're sent on calls all day all day and there's some you know European guy drinking Pellegrino, smoking a cigarette, sending them out for all types of ads. And 
You go to Paris for one part of the season. You go to South Africa for another part of the season. You go to Japan for another part of the season. So you can have a fall four month season, really, if you're a model, right? Mm-hmm. To me, it's low key. There's some low key trafficking, it seems like, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But also now with the Balenciaga thing, there's saint, there's Satanism. It's like that's just as clear as a bell. Yeah. Um, and ritualistic shit. And and the fact that I was at a casino the other day and they had a big Balenciaga store and I was like, damn. And I was like, people are fucking with Balenciaga. And I will say, you know, I do think there's certain cultures that just don't care. Mm. Other cultures that are, I mean, I'm sure Americans do too, but it's mm-hmm. such a big story here. But I see other cultures just going in and consume Balenciaga. But clearly. Yeah, it's just the fashion is weird. There was a whole fashion, the way they wear shit. I don't want to talk about <laughs> the, the other night. I mean, there was pictures of people the other night wearing weird ass uniforms for fashion week. So yeah, there's weirdness there. It's just like, what's your MO here? Yeah. It's weird. And I always thought they were humorless people and self-important people, but now I'm realizing this is fucking weird. Right. Well, I wrote an article in like 2015, um, and it was all about the symbolism of the Super Bowl and the fashion industry and everything. And one of the things that I was connecting was goddesses and lions. And wow. What just happened yep. this week, with, with, Kylie Jenner, the was the big yep. uh, story. With but PETA, PETA um, approved it. Was that supposed to be a real thing or just a fake? It's probably fake. So what's your, what's your take on that? Okay, so, well, um, I give a talk when we do a live show, and we're having one in Austin on February 11th, and I talk about the beginning of civilization and the worship of gods and goddesses in Mesopotamia, Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, those ancient cities. And the most prominent goddess of that time was named Inanna um, or Ishtar in her later uh, evolution. But she was always associated with lions. And so if you want to know more about that, you can look at this article that I wrote on freemantv.com. Or you can get uh, this book right here, or you can come to our live show and you will get a full 90 minute presentation about the beginning of history, Hollywood, um, secret societies. Oh, that's one more thing I was going to tell you, because you said that um, the empire of their own, you were talking about how they all had this thing in common. But another thing that they had in common was that they were all Freemasons. So, I did not know that. Yeah. That's true? Yeah. Yep. That's true? Yeah. And so part of my talk is about how mystery cults, well, that's the beginning of drama, like the origin of plays and acting and theater was the um, acting out the doings of the goddess and goddesses of antiquity. And that's how they would influence society from the secret society, which was a troop of actors and uh magicians and people on drugs i have just like two more questions and then i'll let you go because we're at an hour you i want to know well this is a question that we always ask each other is like how did you start to become aware that things weren't exactly the way that you thought they were because I was traveling around in 2014 with um, Dan Fogler from uh, Fantastic Beasts, and we were doing a movie um, promotion up and down the coast of California, and one of the stops was in Hollywood, and we got to stay the night at Topher Grace's house. He wasn't there, but I did get to sleep in his bed. Um, and I just, as you know, a thank you. <laughs> I'm sure Jay loves hearing that. <laughs> sleep he in his there. bed. Um, but I left these for him for his, you know, hospitality in absentia. And I was just wondering, you know, if these books floated around anywhere and like, 
anybody picked them up because they're they're made to be coffee table books you know that you could just like flip through and be like what and uh so I was just wondering how did you get introduced to like Sam Tripoli and Jay Dyer and those kind of people wait are you asking like did your books inspire me um no not you specifically but I that flow? was just a hope of mine that you know like they would get passed around in Hollywood wait so Dan Fogler is in Fantastic Beasts yes and why were you with him he made a movie um, called Don Peyote that we were involved in, and it was like a very psychedelic. So what were you doing? Hippie. Were you acting in it? I was, you know, part of it. That's very mysterious. Were you an actress? <laughs> no, no. I was dating someone at the time who was in it. Got it. And okay, I, I was there that. for the filming and the production. We became friends. Got it. He needed a, like a troop of merry pranksters to go on this crazy bus tour with him. I got you. So um, we roll up and fall out and, you know, do tricks and promote the movie. Stuff. Okay. So um, when did I start? Say that again. When did I start what? Um, when did you start to wake up and realize like things aren't as uh, normal as what you think they are and then I mean, you've heard of MK Ultra, and you've heard of Jay Dyer, and you've at heard what of level though? Mm. At a basic level or a deepest level? Like the basic level is like knowing you don't get a role, uh -huh. and you're like, I worked really hard on it, but then you realize it's because there's a bunch of bullshit behind the scenes that you didn't get the role, not because you're not good. That type of wake up, or like the deeper stuff that was deeper. About. Um, yeah, I mean, the first wake up on the basic level is when. I went into a comedy club in the early 90s and I had signed up and waited my whole month to do my three minutes and they told me I um, I got bumped and I said why and they said a comedian with more TV credits got your spot but I said I'm a comic and I worked it out and I people like me I'm allowed to audition and they said no you need credits so I, and I realized very young in this business that it's it's um not fair and it's just like, oh, the rules, the goalposts change all the time. So that, that, from a very young age, I learned that about Hollywood. Um, in terms of this stuff, um, I think, um, I don't know. I would say there's a couple of things. I would say, you, I really want to answer this correctly. I started getting into YouTube pretty much a few years ago. I don't know if it's three or five years ago, but I just started watching more YouTube than I did regular stuff. And I think that, um, you know, we had Me Too's and different things like that. I, I want to, you know, and you hear stories of like Gary Glitter you know, and these different people, I think, I think kind of like scandals, you start hearing about scandals and then you're like, like Bill Cosby. And that's like, so literally inverted of like mm -hmm. what his image is and then what he was behind the scenes. So I think enough of those different things hit me and you're like, what? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I just started watching you know youtube um I mean, i've always been aware but when you you know um i don't know i would say the mk ultra is is a pretty good you know entry level thing mm -hmm. and then you know roseanne is great she mm -hmm. was an early adapter of this mm -hmm. and then the the butterfly and i want to say your husband said that a lot monarch butterfly and that i think i can't give you an exact moment but i can tell you when you see the butterfly and i would say i thought about that and i'm like i can't tell you how many people have butterflies on them there's mm -hmm. tons and i can't tell you how many girls would wear that dress or have a butterfly wing or so you would see that all over Hollywood for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, mm, and somewhere at the top, whether it, it wasn't a mandate, but 
infiltrated down. Well, I like this, or why don't you put that on her? Or, hey, girl, we're going to do these stick on tattoos or, you know, and so talking about fashion and stuff, how it can just a series of people make the decision. But if they go, I like that the best and they don't know why they're agreeing, but they have to agree with the boss. Mm -hmm. So that that once I started seeing that, I started going, oh, my God, that like. That makes sense. Um, well, I have here, since you mentioned butterflies in my book, I have the top 10 signs of monarch programming that I kind of compiled. And then so mm -hmm. first you have the butterflies and then you have alternate personalities. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have like possession or satanic imagery um, for beta kitten sexual programming. So having like cat costumes and uh, cat prints a lot. Um, mm -hmm occult hand signs you see a lot of that yeah um masks or bondage see a uh, lot of that multiplicity broken mirrors hypnotic imagery something to look for um wizard of oz alice in wonderland and marilyn monroe obsessions so for me in my book those are the top 10 things that i would look out for and if you've got all 10 then it's a pretty good chance that you are wrapped up in some kind of thing like that you see a lot of it um in terms of sam tripoli he's a comedian i've known him for over 20 years mm -hmm. um you know as but people like him um like you and your husband and different people that are becoming more loud voices you you know they start making sense when you start looking at things and you know you just there's these nuggets of truth are put out there mm -hmm. and then you start looking at them and you're like oh damn yeah oh, damn it's like and um go ahead seed bombs that i've been throwing out for you know 15 years or more and now i'm just seeing it pop up and it, people are running with it i'm so happy that but sorry to cut you. It, it is grown right like this whole thing is grown oh yeah and it's but yeah, I feel like I feel like there's a lot of truth tellers out there or people that are exposing things. And like I said, like I never saw anything weird. Mm -hmm. But you hear of like weird shit, you know, I know. But it's more just like drugs or, you know, creeps. But nothing yeah. like horrific. Now the horrific shit that's coming up more and more. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, when you were on with Jay that you are now kind of in a place where you're being forced to choose sides and you want to be on the side of the righteous. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like to you? Because I had a pretty intense conversion experience um, a couple years ago due to all of this information that I had taken in and I was not doing very good with it. Um, but I ended up joining the Orthodox Church and that sort of, you know, saved my life. Um, so what does being on the side of righteousness look like to you right now? What does that mean? You, you're not, what is your, you're a religious, what's your religion? Orthodox Christian. Okay. What were you before that? Just, um, nothing really spiritual, you know, like hippie a woman on a bus. crystals and, you know, tarot chair. cards <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> um is jay orthodox christian mm -hmm. um yeah, it's a good thing to ask me. well hollywood has changed so much and the more stuff that is smoke you know what i mean it's like there's smoke right and so you're like, hmm, this is, this is it. So to me, that I've done so much and I've been fortunate. I've done a lot. And um, I've had, you know, I never knew what kind of career I was going to have. So I'm very fortunate. I've had, you know, a great career. Um, and I've experienced every emotion. Mm -hmm. So I just think that it's not the same as it was. I don't think it's as fun as it was. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's as innocent as I thought it was. 
or it was to me. I think I'm talking to a lot of people of my generation and they're like, yeah, it's just, it's, it, I see all these people trying to break in still. I'm like, are you, it's not 1982. Like it's a different world. It's, that's why I was like confused with your husband because he was like saying all this like really deep stuff. And then he's like, how do I get a pilot? I'm like, so to me, it's like, it's, there's not, it's not as exciting to me as it once was. Like, we'll see the Oscars this year. Let's see. Like, I was walking through the Las Vegas airport yesterday morning thinking that what the Oscars are great, but like, what if they're, what if, what happened? Your camera went out. Oh, are you there? Oh, there it's you like go. the Oscars are great, but it's like, why is it so great to get an Oscar? Like, I'm not saying it wouldn't be great, but it's like, you're just getting validated by a very small group of people that are dictating you as the best for all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. It's literally like 2,300 people. And there could be a guy in Cleveland that did an amazing, you know, 99 seat theater performance that was incredible. So what I'm trying to say is, it's awesome, mm -hmm. but it feels like the it feels like the shine is wearing off. Mm. And I feel like if more and more stuff comes out, like if it's weird, it's gonna it's just turn it's just gonna turn me off. Mm. So slowly I'm getting more and more turned off. I just from a business standpoint, I'm not gonna sit there and like you know, fight for a job that I've already done everything. I'm not going to do something stupid and I'm not going to like be desperate for anything. Mm -hmm. But like, I want to do what I want, when I want, where I want, you know, and I'm not going to be desperate. But the other thing is, it's like, I feel it's becoming less cool mm -hmm. and it's also just becoming weirder. People are thinking it's weird. Mm -hmm. um, so the path of the righteousness isn't sp specifically a certain religious sect, which, you know, everyone has to work what they want. But I do believe there is a more and more a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. I do believe there, I do believe that there are demonic things out there. And I never really believed that before. I just believe it. Right. And I do believe there's a goodness and a wrongness. And I want to be on the right of goodness. And that's why I feel like I am. That's like my place. Like, that the characters I played are like that. Um, and I believe that my dad was like that. My dad was a super pre-alien guy before anybody. I knew about David Icke in the 80s. Oh, no wow. Did. Okay. Yeah, my dad was deep in it. So, okay. but I, so I, I, you know, I'm a, my mom was a good person. My dad was a good person. I'm very fortunate. I was born of angels. They're angelic oh. people. And God bless them soul. Nice. So they're both passed away, but that's the one thing they instilled in me. So I'm not going to sit there and push an agenda that is not good. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started talking more and more in my YouTube and stuff. So the path of the righteous is that if I end up going to G, if I end up going to uh, church with you and Jay and passing a bread basket, I mean, am I going to sit there and hold palms and sing songs? Probably not, but who knows? But like being a good person is a good person. I don't want to believe in any organized. But, you know, and I also do, believe, but there's some good stuff with it. But I also believe in the crystal shit now, too. Like, there is real stuff with that. There's energy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, the path of the righteous is doing the correct thing. And that is being a good person, not hurting people, putting people's feelings and their livelihood above yours. Very good. Okay. Um, well, I think you're on the right track and we will keep you in our prayers and you've definitely been um, a favorite. We've been watching all the screams and scream six is coming out. So that's exciting. Um, where can people go see you? Like what is your next stand up date? I'm going to be at Looney's um, this weekend in Colorado Springs. Um, that's almost sold out. Two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, whatever this weekend is, January or something. Okay. And then the weekend after that, I'm going to be at Creepy Con with all of my Scream cast, me, Skeet, okay. and Matt. Okay. And that's in Ontario, California on the 4th and the 5th. 
And then the weekend after that, I'm going to be in Indiana. They just go to my website, jamieK.com. jamieK.com. Okay, very good. JamieKennedy.com. JamieKennedy.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I invite all of you watching to come see Jay and us in Austin on February 11th. Come see our live show. It's going to be so much fun. We have comedy. We have lectures. We have a comedian, BJ Cumby, going to be joining us. And we're going to be destroying some Funko Pops and educating y'all on Hollywood Babylon and much, much more. So thank you so much, Jamie, for coming. And I really enjoyed tonight. Thank you so much.